Welcome to everyone watching online and at home. We are in the book of 1 Samuel. And we're starting today in 1 Samuel chapter 4. We have done uh, two so far in the series, Akil and I team preaching through here. We started off and we saw the 1 Samuel, the whole world, the, the history of God's salvation to man changed because of one mother's earnest prayer. And earnest prayer will achieve much more than anything else you and I ever attempt to do. So we believe in prayer. And when you're a parent, you definitely believe in prayer. Because your prayers, the prayers of mothers and fathers, have saved the souls of so many of their children. Um, And we saw the whole thing change from that. And then last week, the call that was placed on Samuel's life by Akil. I'm not going to talk about Kiel's stuff here, I'll talk about mine, he'll talk about his. But today, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 4, and we're looking at where they lose the ark. And the title of our series is From Chaos to Control. Because in in Judges, we discover that God's people have descended into chaos because they didn't hear God's voice anymore. Where is our modern Western culture today? It is in chaos, and it's getting worse, because God's voice is no longer heard, and as it says in the book of Judges, everyone does what is right in their own eyes. There's no unifying set of beliefs that's holding them together. There's no moral values that are accepted universally. Instead, it becomes chaotic, and they lurch from chaos to control. Where is our society about to go? What's the Bible say in Bible prophecy? It's going to go to control. And in fact, this week, and I'm sorry to bring this up, Eliza, you're from Victoria, aren't you? Who, who else here is from Victoria? Oh, okay, a couple, just block your ears for a moment. This week in Victoria, a mother was arrested because she posted on Facebook that she wanted to ha- be involved in a protest, which it turns out she could legally do uh, in her city. So the police in Australia, the police turned up at her house and arrested the woman. And I'm sitting at home, I'm dancing with excitement. I was, and I could not believe that that's happening in my country. You get arrested because of what, a, an opinion or an event you want to put on Facebook, and they were going to confiscate your computer, your phone. Are you joking? I said to my wife, what would happen if they came to my house and did that to me? I would have to have a prayer meeting happening so I could remain Christian. Because I tell you what, that is absolutely disgraceful that it happened in this country. And then my Bible's ringing in my ears because Bible prophecy is crystal clear. It's never been wrong yet. We know what's coming. Control the pendulum is going to swing. It's going to swing from chaos. Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. There's no right or wrong anymore. Yes, there is. And it's going to swing over to control. That's why this book is so good to study. Because this book is in some ways explaining to us what we're going through as well. First Samuel, chapter 4. I haven't got the verses on the screen today because it's been one of those weeks. So it's good to... I've got my glasses, but... So we're going to pray. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Father, as we study your word today... It is your word, Lord. It's a living word. It's not just any old book. It is the holy word of God. As we read this account, as we retell the story, we pray, Father, that you'd apply to our lives, that it wouldn't be about someone else or something else, but it would apply to me. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 4, 
In verse 1, it says, The word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now, Israel went out to battle against the Philistines, the old enemy, and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel, and when they joined the battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. Verse 3, And when the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us before the Philistines had died? Isn't it a funny question? Who defeated Israel that day? The Philistines came and and they had a battle and they lost against the enemy of God's people. But the elders of Israel, when they come back in the camp, they say, hey, why has God defeated us today let me give you a little word of advice from one sinner to another sinner don't go blaming God as soon as something goes wrong in your world he's not the one he's on your team more than you are on your team he's on more he's on your team more than your mum and dad are on your team my mum is like She's my big, she'll be watching this today. If I'm ever on the internet, if I got arrested, she'd be watching it, cheering for me. You know, my, my mom, she supports me no matter how bad I am, she supports me. Well, God supports me more than my mom. Why do we go blaming God as soon as something goes wrong? The Lord has defeated us today. Ah, there could be something else going on in the narrative here where they're going to show us what really led to their defeat. When you have something go wrong in your life, it may not be your fault, by the way. Sometimes I meet people who have just been treated terribly and they'll blame themselves. Don't go blaming yourself necessarily. But in Justin's world, you know who his biggest problem is? Justin. None of you. No, I can't blame Akil. I've tried to blame Akil, but it's not his fault. It's Justin's fault. Chances are, things going wrong in your life are a result of personal choices. Sometimes there are people who do some stuff to you that isn't fair. I don't want to say it's your fault on that. It's their personal choices. But in the background and overall, God is on your team and he's on your side. He's not defeating you. He's trying to wake you up. It's interesting to see what happens. We're going to continue on in verse 3. The elders of Israel said, Let's bring the ark of the covenant. Oh boy, I'm speeding through the city, I'm, I'm dodging traffic, breaking the speed limit, but I've got a cross hanging on my mirror, so I'm going to be safe. I've got the token there, the good luck charm that keeps me safe even though I'm breaking the law. And they want to bring out their good luck charm, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant is not something we're very familiar with today. I wish I had a tape measure. Houston, you're, you're a smart guy, aren't you? You're a, what, your qualifications are in um, stonemason. The ark was 1.3 meters, so that's the edge of it. 1.3 meters long. About there, Houston. Give me, give me some guidance. Okay, okay. One point, it's 1.3 meters long. It is 76 centimeters high. About there. Come on, help me. Down. And it's also 76 centimeters wide. It is made of acacia wood, but it's then covered in gold inside and out. It arc means box or chest. And the lid is made of solid gold. Has two angels carved in gold or molded cherubim the anointed cherub who covers lucifer was once one of those sits on the box 
it was like a magic box at this point to the children of Israel, but it wasn't magic at all. And by the way, you know what happened to it, don't you? Jeremiah, and he, he spoke about it in Jeremiah 3.16, you can go and read that sometime. Jeremiah hid it in a cave when the Babylonians were coming to conquer Jerusalem. He went and hid in a cave and they said, should we mark the way? Jeremiah says, this is in the book of Maccabees, it's an extra biblical book. He says, no, don't mark the way. It is probably in a cave somewhere in the Middle East to this day. If you're ever wandering around in, in uh, Israel and you stumble onto a cave and you look in and you see that, call me first. Jeremiah, if you find this, call me. I'm going to come and help you carry it out. It would be worth a lot of money. Because the ark, what made it so special was not the fact it was 1.3 meters long and 76 centimeters high. That's not what made it special. What was inside of the Ark of the Covenant. The two tablets of stone, the Bible says, those two tablets of stone were written on by God Himself. Wouldn't it be neat to find them? And what was written on those two tablets of stone? The Ten Commandments, Ling, that's right. In fact, you don't have to go and dig it up. You can just turn to Exodus chapter 20. And in Exodus chapter 20, you can read what's on there. These two tablets of stone are the, the testament or the covenant. That's why it's the box of the covenant, because within the box were the two rocks, the law of God that was written down by God Himself, the covenant keeping God. Wow. And the story gets really interesting. The question gets answered as we follow on. Please follow with me in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, please uh, pull your phone out and Google First Samuel 4. First Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, so the people sent to Shiloh. That's the place where the tent of meeting was set up. They sent to Shiloh that they might bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. You can get a sense of the gravity of what they're doing here. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. Why were we defeated in battle? The two guys, they go and get the magic box and they're carrying the poles. Their name are Hophni and Phinehas. Are Hophni and Phinehas, we've already met them in our series. Are they good guys or bad guys? They're some of the worst. We know of at least three of the laws on those rocks in the box, the, the Ten Commandments. They dishonored their father. They were sleeping around and they were stealing. They were stealing the sacrifices from God Himself. Amazingly, these two guys were carrying out the magic box. Within the magic box is the answer to their questions of why they'd been defeated. You see, God's intention for the law was to actually convert and save us. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms 19. Psalm 19, uh, one of the great Psalms of Scripture. Psalm 19, and we want verse 7 and 8. In Psalm 19, David is describing creation and how it points to the invisible God in the first six verses. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament, His handiwork. But then he goes on, he says, the law of the Lord, verse 7, is perfect, converting the soul. Converting the soul. Our society has become so confused. I'm not, I'm probably getting into trouble for some of the stories I'm going to tell you today. Can I get in trouble with you today? Will you defend me? Oh boy, that's two of you coming to court. Who's going to visit me in prison? Yeah, you say so. You know, sorry, here we go. 
My friend lives in Victoria. I'm sorry, Eliza, I'm picking on Victoria today, but that got under my skin this week. Daniel Andrews. Down in Victoria. My friend's son, I've known him since he was this high, he's about that high now. He goes along to a Christian school. In a Christian school, <laughs> they had a day um, where they had to all wear purple. All the students were encouraged to wear purple so they could celebrate diversity. What specific diversity do you think they were celebrating? All the colors of the rainbow, that's much I'm going to say. Sexual diversity. Christian school. This is not a secular school. This is a Christian school. And in the Christian school, they all had to wear purple. And this young fellow who's grown up and he's got red hair. Is that a good thing, Lee? It's a bad thing. He, sent, he finds every verse in the Bible on that particular topic, clouding the story here, and he sends it to his teacher. And you know, he's going to get expelled now from his school. He didn't put any comments, he just, just cut and paste verses on the particular topic they were celebrating and sent it to his teacher, and my friend has to go into the principal's office, so they're going to kick their... They haven't yet, but they're going to kick his boy out of the school because in a Christian school, he quotes back the Bible. Talk about chaos. That's why, you know, control is very close behind. Talk about chaos. The answer to Israel's problems lied in those two rocks in the box because it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. If you get rid of the law, you'll get rid of Jesus in the same breath. How so? He says, uh, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the law is pure enlightening the eyes and if you come back to the new testament with me come to romans chapter chapter three because this is where i really want you to see why the answer was already in the box and hophni and phineas should have stopped on the way there and pulled them out they probably weren't allowed to touch them but someone could have taken them out and just read them because it says in romans chapter three and verse 20 romans chapter three and verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the deeds of the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, the, the intention of the... Why at the center of Israel's service was the law? The law was to tell you and to tell me that we are sinful and we are weak, that we are broken, and that we need a Savior. We need a Savior. And Hophni and Phineas, in their presumption, are running down there with the golden box, thinking the box will fix everything, when in fact God wants us to acknowledge what the law tells me about Justin. And that Justin needs a saviour. And I would humbly on my knees ask God for help and he would deliver me victory in the battles of life. That's how it was supposed to work. The law wasn't ever going to save Israel. And having it there, <laughs> we just need it out the front and we'll be fine. No, no, no. You need to apply it to your life. Because when you look into it, you know, the law has three great purposes. It's a muzzle on society. If I leave my car outside with the keys in it, how long will it sit there? Depends on the society in which I do that in. In Canberra, how long will that last? Yeah, they won't even notice in Canberra. Is that true? Depends which part. There's parts of Belcon and I'm not too sure about. <laughs> but, uh, you know, 
the muzzle, my, I got a cattle dog that uh, my son, we use it to move cattle, but we taught it how to move cattle on sheep. And you don't let a cattle dog near sheep unless he's got a muzzle on because cattle dogs bite. They bite the cows because the cows try and push at them, but the sheep don't do that. You don't want your dog to bite sheep, so you have to put a muzzle on him. And the muzzle is the law on society. It keeps us safe at night. Praise God, we have police officers who aren't arresting us for Facebook, but in fact, they're dealing with real crime because that's not a crime. Boy, I'm going to do a sermon on that. I can feel it coming. Free speech. What a beautiful gift from God. We can say what we want to say and bear the consequences ourselves without the government and the police getting involved. That's off the topic. The other thing that the law is, it's a map. You want a happy life? Look at what the rocks are saying in the box because those rocks are going to give you a basic moral guidance that will serve you in just about every situation you could possibly imagine. You don't need 400 laws, you only need 10. And if you apply the principles of the 10, you're going to have a happy life. But the last and the important purpose of the law is it's a mirror. It's a mirror showing me my need of Jesus. He paid the price for my sins on a cross because I've broken the law. I break the law. Well, he took my place and therefore I'm indebted to him and in love to him, in love to him for what he's done for me. I choose to live by the rocks in the box. I hope that makes sense. It's working for me. Come back to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Things start to go downhill very rapidly as they take it out there. The Bible says uh, in verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 4, the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So the plan of bringing the magic charm out didn't work because they ignored what it was telling them to do. They lose the ark. This is a total catastrophe. It's a catastrophe. The very essence of Israel's worship, the centerpiece, the masterpiece of what was in the sanctuary was taken by a pagan nation. And a runner comes and tells old Eli the priest, if you follow on in the story, it says in verse 18, then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God. He just said to Eli, your two sons were killed. Yep, keep telling me. Yep, they, they, he doesn't have a lot of compassion for his sons because his sons are evil. And if you're a parent of evil children, you pray for them more and more and more. He is, he's tired of his sons. His sons are dead. Yeah, yeah, but what about the ark? He doesn't even blink when he hears his sons are dead. What about the ark? It says, when they made mention of the ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backwards by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died. That's a little serious. The high priest hears that the ark has been stolen. This is a catastrophe. He falls backwards off his chair. Children at school, don't rock on your chair. I rocked on my chair the whole way through school. You used to do it too, Houston, didn't you? You're smiling. I can tell all the chair rockers. Don't rock on your chair. He rocked on his chair. He fell backwards in distress. He was, a, he was an old man and apparently he was a heavy man, it says. He was overweight and he broke his neck and died. And right at that moment, a grandchild is being born, have mercy. And the mother is in terrible distress. She dies, and before she dies, she names the child. And when I come to church sometimes, parents say, Pastor, will you dedicate our child? I say, sure, happy to do that. What's the name of the child? I never want to hear the word Ichabod is the name of the child. There's a lot of nice biblical names, Nathan and I don't know, 
What's a nice biblical name? Joshua, Samuel, David, John, Luke, Mark. They're everywhere today. Jeremiah. But please, don't call your son Ichabod. Ichabod. That's what she names his poor child. It means the glory of the Lord has departed. What a catastrophe. The church isn't doing what it's supposed to do. It's lost everything. Now, who's going to tell the world about God? Ah, my friends. God is very capable of looking after himself. Can you turn to the person and say, God's got this covered. Turn to the person beside you. God's got this covered. Sometimes we think in the church, oh, if it's not for us, no one is going to get to believe in God. No one's going to hear about God. I want to tell you, that is a lie. It's a lie. We see it in the Bible work team all the time. We don't have to go looking for people. God sends them to us because it's His work. This is his job. And so they steal the ark and they think, aha, now we've got Israel's ark. We're going to have their God as our God now. Oh, are you? Okay. So let's take that and we're going to put it in our church and we're going to put it right down the front in front of most holy Dagon, an idol, a pagan idol who's half man and half fish. They sat the ark of the living God in front of a pagan idol. <laughs> you don't, God doesn't need the church. He doesn't need you. He can do this all on his own. It is our privilege to be a part of it. If you get a chance to speak up for God, count it a privilege because he's quite capable of speaking up for himself. Doesn't need you, doesn't need me. Does that relieve you of pressure? Praise the Lord, he doesn't need me. So they put him in there and they come in in the morning to have family worship in front of Dagon and Dagon is laying face down and they said, who did that? Maybe it was windy in the temple and he blew over last night. It had weighed tons, this big bronze statue. Everyone was trying to think of an excuse. Oh, well, it might have been just a big bang. Something happened out of nothing. That must be what it is. It was a big bang. Got here by accident. That would explain life. Kaboom! And there's the complexity of an eye. What a ridiculous theory. Why do people believe that stuff? Anyway, they, be- they thought that. So the next day, they come in to have family worship in front of Dagon. And the Bible says that Dagon was laying face down and his head was snapped off and his hands were snapped off. He has a fish's tail, Dagon. They got the message. And they said, please, Ashdod doesn't want the ark anymore. Can you take it somewhere else? Take it to Gath or to Ekron. But we have seen enough of the ark. Thank you very much. It's starting to scare us. And they send it over to Gath or to Ekron, whichever one comes next. And there the people get plagued. There's mice everywhere. There's tumors. Everything's going wrong. And for seven months, the living God spoke through a golden box with some rocks in it. And after seven months, the Bible says that the elders of the Philistines got together and they said, we can't take it anymore. Send it back in utter reverence and respect now for the living God. If only we had been there doing some program, a prophecy seminar, we could have got them converted. If only we had been there doing a chip program, we would have got the Philistines... God's capable of saving people all on his own. But he wants us to share in it with him. And lo and behold, the Bible says that they sent the ark back. They sent the ark back on a cart. They said, let's get these two cows. They don't know where to go, the cows. Bovine experience is not always that intelligent. They're not that smart, but we're going to put these two cows 
the bovines are going to carry it and we're going to put all these golden offerings. We're given all the money we got. They tithe and some towards the living God and then they sent the cows off. We'll see, let's see where it goes. And the cows just turn straight away and head towards the temple, the, the Shiloh, because an angel was leading them. Again, God doesn't need you and I. It's just our privilege to be involved. And when the Israelites see him coming down across the paddock, they get so excited, they run over. They do not have the respect that the pagans have for the ark. And the Bible says that 70 of them died because they tore the curtain straight off and looked at it when you were not permitted or allowed to do that. And they died. My friends, i got 20 seconds left. That went quick. We live in very unusual and strange times. My friend in America, he's got red hair. His name is Donald Trump. I'm looking at you, Di. Okay, I'm not here to defend Donald Trump, but if he's got red hair, it can't be all bad. You know, just say red hair. Good thing. You know, you know, have you noticed on TV that Donald Trump has started to go to church all the time? Every other day he's got a pastor there with his arm around a pastor. He's holding up the Bible in front of the burning churches. And he's all of a sudden, Donald has found religion. God bless Donald. Somehow, I'm not Donald's judge, praise the Lord. But somehow I think it's a bit like that golden box. It's a bit magical. All of us have to read the rocks within the box. There's no magic. There's just a conviction of sin. And under that conviction of sin, we become broken and we reach out to a Savior called Jesus. And He forgives us. That's true religion. This control stuff that's coming, it's not true. It's a form of godliness. It's like having the golden box. We're a Christian nation. You know 12% of Australians go to church? That doesn't make us Christian. What makes you a Christian is if you've submitted to what the law says about my life and I say, I need a Savior in Jesus. That makes me a Christian. Your sin qualifies you. Your sin why has the Lord defeated us? Because we have ignored what He's told us. We've been more pagan than the pagans. And now we're going to bring out a magic box and that's going to fix everything? There's no magic. There's a deep conviction of the Holy Spirit of God on the human heart. That's what saves us. That's what makes us Christian. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Father... We are so thankful today that we can see in your word there have been other, other times in history where chaos has led to control. And I just get a feeling, Father, that we're in the pendulum swing right now. The extremes of the left are swinging over and they're going to go to the extremes of the right. But Father, today we acknowledge what that says in the law about Justin. It says that he needs Jesus and only with Jesus can I be saved. Only with the forgiveness that he offers me, not because I've done anything good or I've got a magic box, none of that. But Father, today we acknowledge that you are God and that your law is holy, just and good and it points out the deficiencies of my life. Thank you for it. May we live by it, but most of all, may it be the schoolmaster that points us to Jesus, our Saviour. Bless us in this, we ask today, that we be humble, converted people who submitted to the declaration that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified freely by your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you soon.